Good evening and welcome to Multiverse Concert Series, Return to the Reef. Uh, we're thrilled to have you all here. Many of you joined us two years ago for our first encounter with corals, simpler times perhaps. And I'm thrilled to say that our guest marine biologist, Dr. Sarah Davis of BU is joining us again. I'm bringing in with her, Dr. Hani Rivera uh, to give us a global perspective on the state of coral reefs around the world. I'm here in the New School of Music in Cambridge with our featured soloist, Elizabeth Cladill, who'll be performing a program of solo piano works. Other presenters are phoning in via the Zoom webinar, which has an amazing question and answer feature. So if you're uh, intrigued by what you see and what you hear, um, Please type your questions. We'll see them live and we're again looking forward to um, answering them at the end. That's for the musicians and for the scientists both. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Elizabeth Cladill, who will introduce the piano works for this evening. Enjoy the show. Thanks so much, David. It is incredibly exciting to be able to connect science and music in such a special way on this kind of program. Um, the music in this program is meant to provide a time for us to, to reflect and think about and also emotionally react to what, what we're learning about the corals. There is um, music that expresses sadness over what's happening to the corals. There's music that um, reflects the awesomeness and the expansiveness and the timelessness of the oceans. And there's also music that expresses hope, hope for our future, um, the future of our planet, and hope that there is still time for us to make changes in the ways that we take care of the environment. The first piece I'll play for you today is um, Ondine by Claude Debussy from his second book of Preludes. There's so much art and literature and music that reflects the relationship that people on land have with the oceans. And this is one such piece. The myth of Ondine is about a water nymph who falls in love with a mortal man. Unfortunately, he is unfaithful to her. And so she gets revenge. Ondine by Claude Debussy.
it's a delight to play for you into your living rooms. And now I'd like to hand our whole program over to Dr. Sarah Davies. She's an assistant professor at Boston University, and she'll be preventing, presenting the first scientific segment of our program entitled, Corals, Animals, Rocks, and Plants in Peril. So first off, I'd just like to say how excited I am to see all the panelists come in. And I think one of the really incredible things about doing this via Zoom during a pandemic is that we can share this whole event with people from across the world. So um, yeah, and for anyone who's interested, um, you can follow me on Twitter. Um, so the first piece is called Corals, Animals, Rocks, and Plants in Peril. Um, so this is review for those of you that were in the audience for the first part of the night. Um, so this is a coral. This is a picture of a coral um, in Micronesia that I took when I was in the field. And it's beautiful, of course, because most corals are. Um, and when you zoom in, um, you can see that they are actually animals. So these are tiny little anemone looking organisms and we call these polyps and they're all genetically identical. So just like us, corals are animals. So when you think about the tree of life across animals, corals are down here. So here's our little polyps and we are up here. Here's some fancy women that just won the Nobel Prize. And um, corals are also rocks. So that's what we think of. That's what most people think of when they think of reefs, I think, because maybe you've gone snorkeling and you've accidentally kicked one and that kind of hurts. Um, so they're also really amazing because below the polyps are is a calcium carbonate skeleton. Um, and this is just like our bones, they're internal. Um, so this is what a cross section of a coral would look like. So you can see the red part is the live tissue and you can see it kind of go into the skeleton and the skeleton is beneath it. So the entire surface of a coral is live animal and then below it is the calcium carbonate skeleton that that individual coral has actually made. So they're literally building blocks on the reef. And these coral skeletons that they make are amazing. So these have, you know, bewildered scientists forever, naturalists, um, for as long as we've been able to go into the ocean and find them. Um, and they create these beautiful multitude of um, varieties of skeletons. Um, lots of people find them on the beach and think they're really cool. Um, and this is a reef. So all of these different corals have different strategies, different formations, and everyone has a favorite coral. Um, but these are plating corals that you see in this picture for the most part. And they create these huge entire ecosystems that wouldn't be there without the coral animal. Um, so these rocks provide house not only for the coral, but also for all the organisms that live on the reef. Um, but corals are surprisingly also plants. So when you zoom in, here's that coral polyp again. But now each of these little kind of yellow smudges is actually algal symbiont cells. So these are symbiotic algae that live within the coral. Um, and then, so here's a coral, we zoom in. Now this is a single coral polyp. We're looking under a confocal microscope here. And each red dot is a coral algal cell. So those are those single celled algae that live within the coral. So they actually integrate them into, their, into themselves. Um, and they're really important. So this is what they look like under the microscope. So maybe not as charismatic as coral, but equally important. So when we think about the symbiosis between corals and their algae, we see that um, the algae provide photosynthetic byproducts in the form of carbon sugars. So they're providing tasty treats for their coral hosts. And the host obviously gives them a free place to live, um, but also provides um, CO2. So they need that for photosynthesis. Um, so this symbiotic relationship is the building block of the coral reef. And these reefs are in peril. So both of these reefs on this, um, in this example here are beautiful, but any coral enthusiast would tell you that the one on the left is more beautiful than the one on the right. And this is because the one on the left is healthy and the one on the right is bleached. So what is coral bleaching and how, how does it happen? So first I need to tell you about the Earth's greenhouse. So here's the Earth. Um, we're somewhere like, well, I'm here. Who knows where all of you are? I know there's some people from Texas, some people from um, Canada. 
Um, so thanks for all of the people from all over the world tuning in. Um, but around the globe is the greenhouse. And this is made up of a variety of um, substances ranging from water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. Um, and this, this is like, you know, biology or earth science 101. Um, so the sun's rays hit the um, earth's greenhouse and lots of them get reflected off. But some of them penetrate through the greenhouse and then come to earth and that's what keeps us warm. And without it, the earth would actually be in, in uninhabitable. Um, so what happens is that as you increase any of these um, greenhouse gases, which I told you carbon dioxide is one of them, you're actually serving to warm the earth. So this is the reading from today. So this is October 15th, 2020, and we're at 411 parts per million. And you don't need to know what that means. All you need to look at is just the historical context for CO2 in the atmosphere. So we see this is looking from like 1700. And we see since about you know, 1970-ish, we've seen an exponential increase in CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, and for context, when I was doing my dissertation work, when I lived in Texas, it was in 2009, we were under 400. So just in the short period of time, we've increased a lot. And these CO2 concentrations are highly correlated with temperature because like I said, CO2 is a greenhouse gas. It serves to trap the rays of the sun and therefore warms up the earth. So it's not perfectly correlated, but temperature is in blue and CO2 is in orange. And you can see that through time, this is looking at thousands of years ago. So like throughout all of the time of the earth, we've, you know, there's been a tight, pretty tight correlation between temperature and CO2. And then recently we have this huge increase in CO2 and that is correlated with getting really hot. So this is looking at temperature anomalies. So this is from 1880 to 2015. It's actually till 2019, um, or sorry, to 2018. Um, and what you see is the blue bars are the 20 coldest years, and the red bars are the 20 warmest years. And you can see that we're doing a pretty good job of warming ourselves up pretty fast. And what does that mean for corals? It means that they start to bleach. Um, so this is looking at a healthy coral. So these are, this is a coral cell and inside you can see the symbiotic cells, uh, the algae. And when it gets too hot and also a variety of stressors, corals are pretty sensitive. Um, they expel their algae. And we don't actually know how this, um, like the mechanism that causes the exact release of the algae. And this causes, but regardless, these little coral animals are actually see-through. Um, so they're still alive. The animal's still there. Um, but now they're see-through and now all you're seeing is their white calcium carbonate skeleton. So they look bleached. Um, and then eventually if, so you can imagine that you've essentially lost your food resources. So all of your algae have left, there's no more photosynthesis, um, yummy sugars. And so eventually the coral, if it doesn't recover, will uh, starve to death. And death, um, usually what happens is the coral gets covered in this turfing macroalgae. And this is what's happening. So, you know, I gave this talk um, in 2018 and I showed the left two panels looking at, this is just looking at the Great Barrier Reef. So the largest barrier reef in the world. Um, and in 2016, we saw one of the most severe bleaching episodes ever. Um, and everywhere you see a red dot was a severe bleaching. Um, and then green dots were ones that did not experience um, severe bleaching. And you can see that the Northern Barrier Reef was hit really hard in 2016. And then the Central Barrier Reef was hit in 2017. And now 2020, we're seeing that with the exception of this ribbon area down here, most of the Southern Reef is getting bleached as well. So these are consecutive massive coral bleaching events happening almost back to back. And this is what reefs are looking like. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing. And next, Elizabeth will play Tide by Aida Shirazi.
That was Tide by Aida Shirazi. The next piece I'll play is entitled Threnody by Carl Vine. A threnody is a piece that's a lament. In this case, a lament for what's happening to the corals.
Dr. Sarah Davies is going to present to us the second part of our lecture entitled Regeneration. So regeneration. These are two individuals um, and this one here is bleached and the other one is not. And this is, these are some corals from our experiments. Um, this is the coral Sideraster Sidorea. Um, and these are four individuals from the same reef, reef in the same treatment responding in very different ways. And this is an example of an individual. So this is a huge coral um, and in 2014 experienced a bleaching event. So this huge individual will be hundreds of years old and it bleached. So everyone was really worried about this coral, but they went back in 2018 and it had fully recovered. So bleaching doesn't mean that the coral necessarily dies. There's also resilient coral species. So this, these are three different species here. This species is fully bleached this species is partially bleached and this one isn't bleached at all. This is an example from a cold water bleaching event oops, in 2010. So this is um, that same kind of big coral we saw that bleached and recovered. Um, this is in the Florida Keys and this is healthy. And then after the cold water bleaching event, it is dead and covered in macroalgae. This is a coral, the mustard hill coral, and this is what it looks like healthy. It doesn't even look that cute when it's healthy. Um, but here it is covered in sediment and it's not quite dead yet, but it's not doing great. And this is the coral that we work on. Um, one of the corals that we work on, Sideraster siderea, and this is it before and after it actually has more algae and is fine. So there's lots of variation between coral species. Um, and there's also resilient coral reefs just more generally. So this is called North Reef and Capricorn Bunkers on the Great Barrier Reef. So this is what it looked like in 2006, fully covered in corals. Um, in 2010, it was decimated, almost no coral cover at all. In 2012, you can start to, if you squint your eyes, see some little corals popping up. And then by 2014, it looks almost exactly like it did in 2006. So stories like this give coral biologists like me hope that um, these corals can recover from these bleaching events. And just on a personal note in our lab, we study kind of three areas that are really unique that we think of as kind of reef refugia. So this is a coral reef in Northern Japan um, where corals didn't used to live. So 20 years ago, these coral reefs didn't exist and with warming temperatures. So what's really interesting about Japan is it's warming up much more quickly than other places in the ocean. And in response to that, corals are actually shifting their ranges and moving up into these warmer waters. So this is a picture from one of these Japanese reefs and you can see that the coral cover is insane. And there's not a lot of diversity, so it's mostly just a couple species, um, but it's a pretty unique place. Um, this is one of my favorite sites. You, uh, if anyone knows me, they've heard me yabber about it forever. Um, but this is the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. Um, in the Gulf of Mexico. So this reef exists about 100 miles south of the Texas-Louisiana border and um, its coral cover is over 50 percent and it has been like that since um, it was first designated as a national marine sanctuary in 1992. And the third place um, is Palau in an area called the Rock Islands and these these areas get so warm and so acidic and they seem like no coral should live there, but there's these crazy diverse communities that live in the rock islands. Um, so these are must be very resilient reefs to be living in such a place. So when we think about these three places, um, they offer beacons of hope. However, this hope is never guaranteed. Um, for example, in Japan, we're seeing that the winters are getting spikes of cooler temperatures causing cold water bleaching and also in the summer even those northern reefs are experiencing temperatures that are anomalously warm and this is also causing coral bleaching so these sites even though they look like they have high coral cover just this year experienced a massive bleaching event the flower garden banks this is a, a die-off event that happened in 2016 um, recreational scuba divers were in the water and just started noticing coral just sloughing their tissue off so polyps just dying in the water column. Um, and since then we went down and we researched what happened during this event. And we found that we think that it was most likely a low oxygen event. So corals need oxygen because they're animals. So they need to breathe. Um, and what happened is that there was a lot of flooding in Texas that's, that spring. Um, they called them the tax day floods. 
So some of the most fresh water that's ever entered the Gulf of Mexico from these um, tributaries that didn't usually um, release that much water. And it caused this huge um, plume of fresh water into the Gulf of Mexico that reached the flower garden banks and caused a low oxygen event. And this is from um, this week um, there, or for sorry, late September, but Palau is currently experiencing bleaching and researchers that are on site have documented bleaching in the rock islands. So it seems like even some of our favorite places to study aren't really um, safe. So what is being done about all of this coral loss? So I wanted to talk about coral restoration. So lots of really fun, amazing coral restoration is being done across the world. Um, and one of the ways to restore a coral reef is to fragment the coral. Like I told you, there's many polyps across an entire colony and all of those are the same individual. So you can fragment a coral into multiple pieces like this and they're the same individual. And then you can propagate them like this and outplant them either onto these trees. So this is the coral restoration consortiums. These are their uh, coral growing trees that they put into the water column. These corals grow very fast and then they outplant them onto the reef to um, restore reefs that are degraded. Um, so this is the coral restoration consortium. And those of you that came to our event in 2018, um, that was where the proceeds went from the last event. There's also sexual propagation. So this is the idea I told um, for those of you that were at the pre-event, I talked about coral spawning. So corals spawn once a year and it's predictable by the temperature, the warmest month, um, eight days after the full moon, um, all the corals release their gametes or their um, like eggs and sperm. And then, so you can imagine you could take a nursery, these nursery corals that I showed you, these trees, and we cover them in tents and this collects all of their gametes and then we can um, mix them up, mix and match them and then make coral babies. Um, so this is doing it in the wild. So this is on a wild colony. We make these fancy nets. Um, our lab's nets don't look quite this fancy. Um, but these, what we do is we um, mix the eggs and sperm together and these great little larvae, this is what a larvae looked like. Um, they're really cute. They can swim around and sense the environment. And then they settle into what we call a coral polyp. So these are the little polyps I showed you. And you can see the brown color comes from the symbiotic algae. Um, so it looks like this in like scientist nerd form. So you have a couple individuals, you mix them up, they make the little planula larvae, and then we settle them. So you have new genotypes because you mixed two different parents. Um, so this is a way to try to increase genetic diversity on the reef, whereas the other way, the fragmentation, the exact same individuals everywhere. Um, the other really cool thing that's happening in coral research and just coral husbandry more generally is coral restoration in the form of captive breeding. So some of the first coral spawning was done by Jamie Craig at the Horniman Museum in the UK. Um, so they have spent a lot of money and done a lot of research on um, finding the exact cues that corals need to, um, to cue that lunar cycle I told you about. So they need the exact sunlight and lunar light that corals experience on the reef. Um, and this has also been done at Ames, the Australia Institute of Marine Science. Um, and what's really cool is that normally corals only spawn once a year, but these researchers have now been able to bamboozle corals to release gametes twice a year. So we can try to increase the reproductive output um, from these corals. Um, more interesting news from the Florida Aquarium this last summer is that they were, uh, they spawned Dendrogyra, which is a highly critically endangered species. They spawned it in the lab um, and they, they had successful spawning of other species as well. But I'm gonna <laughs> get negative again. Um, not all uh, regeneration works. So this was some work um, putting out these um, fragments of corals. Each of these fragments is a different uh, individual. So it's a fragment of a different coral uh, genetic background. Um, and all of them bleached um, in this experiment trying to figure out which uh, corals would do best in this environment. So even though we, we have all these coral fragments in the lab, Sometimes when we outplant them, if the corals all around on the reef are dying, it's probably not good habitat for corals more generally. 
The other thing that's a bummer is that you can have these restored reefs, um, but then hurricanes can come through and totally destroy. So this is um, before Hurricane Irma and Maria, this is in Florida, and this is after. So these thickets of um, this species is called Acroporus overcornus. They're used to dealing with high impact storms. That's kind of what, the, what their jam is. Um, and it breaks them apart, but usually they can like regrow, they're like zombies. Um, so I don't know what this reef looks like now. So it could be that these have regenerated, um, but these more frequent and more intense hurricanes that are happening with climate change are definitely something that um, researchers are really worried about. Um, and Hani's gonna tell you a little bit in um, the third part about why hurricanes, why we should be so worried about hurricanes. And the last thing is um, this crazy disease that is going through the Caribbean. So this is happening right now. These are pictures from this reef this, this week. This is from the Coral Reef Futures Lab. Um, and this disease is called skittled or stony coral tissue loss disease. And skittled sounds really cute and yummy tasty skittles, um, but it's not for the corals. So it creates these lesions and quickly progresses across the entire colony. So this is a brain coral. This is another brain coral on a close up. And it happens, the other crazy thing that is happening is that it affects multiple species um, and seems to prefer older colonies. So some of those are the bigger colonies on the reef. Um, but the other, the good news is that lots of researchers are working really hard to try to document the movement of this disease. And you can see here, um, skittled treatments. So there's actually some treatments out there where if they apply them to the lesion area, they can actually stop the progression of the disease within the colony. Um, so there's a lot, this is an area of active research. Um, and um, yeah, so we're just monitoring where this disease is going and trying to do in the field kind of, um, yeah, so corals not like, you know, they're experiencing their own kind of pandemic, um, but they can't wear masks. So um, we have to go in and try to fix them. Um, so I always get asked this question, like what's gonna happen to corals? Like, will they persist? Why are you studying something if it's, you know, it's the end? Um, and I feel, yes, there's like a lot of bad news. Um, so as the, as the water warms and as we kind of degrade, continue to degrade our environments and not prioritize them, um, I do think that they will be negatively impacted and I don't know exactly what they'll look like, but I do think they, will be present, but I just think that they'll be fundamentally different than what we know of corals now. Um, so with that, we have Emma Shubin and Veronica Bolesky from Integral Steps, and they're gonna lead us in a special audience activity called Music, Movement, and Mutualism. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Emma Shubin. I'm the director of Integral Steps, and um, I'm looking for my co-host. Um, you have to turn on my video. I don't have that power. Got it. Pardon me one moment here. All right, it's really great to have us all here today. Um, we are very excited to be presenting a music and movement. Um, hey, I'm, I'm so sorry, one more thing. Can you put the spotlight on yourself? I'm working on it, yes. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> all right. So here we both are, I hope. <laughs> and, um, I am just delighted to be here today with the Multiverse Concert Series. We are really honored to be welcomed back. Our whole wish in life is to find new ways to integrate different types of learning, including science, music, movement, and art. And so today you're going to need a scarf, if you have it, or um, a clean pair of socks can work just as well. And um, if you're willing to stand up and give some space to move, that would be great. Um, if you're standing, I want you to find some softness in your knees and see if you can follow my music that I'm going to make. There's going to be an option to pass your scarf from side to side if you would like. Please go for it. And if 
something interrupts the movement of my music, toss your scarf in the air. And so Veronica is kindly going to be my other. So she'll be the one to show us because it's hard to do this when I don't get to play for somebody. <laughs> so Veronica, I'm gonna mute you while we do this activity. especially those of us who may be adults. We don't always love to use our whole bodies, but we will happily move an object. And so I hope that helped you to find something in the music. What we were listening to was the pulse inside of our music. And in the piece that we are introducing to you, um, you will notice as you're listening that there is something that always comes back to something that feels like home, and that there's this very fast pulse that lives inside of the music. And these interruptions. So Veronica is going to take it from here and what you'll need to find is your paper and some of your pencils. All right. Um, so what I would like you to do is um, make a mark on your paper and it's gonna be a gesture that will match with a sound. So we'll just try one gesture and one sound. Here we go. Um, so hopefully you have something to represent my first short gesture and then something else to represent my long gesture. Um, and Emma show, showed hers and yours might, might look the same or might look different. Um, and what we're making is a graphic score. And so in a graphic score, rather than using our traditional music notation of five lines and spaces and the notes um, written out by exactly by the rhythm and by their pitch, instead we're trying to capture the gesture of the music and the, the, the feeling it gives us. And, um, and a graphic score can have all sorts of shapes and all sorts of uh, graphic designs. Um, and so what I'd like to invite you to do is to take um, your favorite color, maybe it's a pencil or a pen or a marker, um, and, and we're just going to listen to my flute music and, and you're going to make these uh, gestural records of the music that you're hearing. Um, and when the music changes, maybe you'll change colors. 
if the music has an interruption, just like in Emma's music, maybe there'll be something on your paper to mark that event. I was making some experiments earlier today and I played my music, I recorded it, and then I said, okay, I'm gonna play back the recording and draw it. And I realized that it made a difference in my score, whether my um, wrist was touching the paper or whether it was up in the air. And so I just want you to remember which one you did and we're gonna do it one more time and give it a try. What does it feel like to change that your wrist is free floating or maybe your wrist is touching the paper? How does that um, create different possibilities for your gestures. shapes that follow along with Veronica's music. So Veronica, if you don't mind being my scarf person one last time, we do have a couple extra minutes because we're running ahead. And I just do want you guys to see a friend out there <laughs> to use movement and see now how it feels to move to the music after you've listened to music and drawn to it. You've maybe had an experience of moving before or wondering what we were talking about exactly. And hopefully now you'll be able to see I'm gonna mute Veronica and I think we've got us both now. So the pulse inside the music and listening to the shape. And so if you hear the music go high, your scarf will go high. And if you hear something go low, you can try now to also have your scarf go low. <laughs>
thank you so much for being with us this evening. And we're going to let you take us. Yes, in. we would love to see your pictures. And so we're going to use the uh, glorious power of social media. Um, if you could take a picture of your drawing and if you tag it with return to the reef and tag um, both integral steps and multiverse, um, then everyone listening uh, to this presentation and concert right now will be able to um, see each other's drawings. So it's a way for us to be together. Um, and we are also going to select two random winners uh, of submissions, and we will send you a real piece of coral in the mail. So we hope that that is something fun that makes you excited about posting. And um, we also hope that you just see uh, what everyone else who is at home uh, tuning into the same call as you um, is doing. And we should add that um, our hope is that you'll explore this drawing while you listen to Elizabeth, Elizabeth play her next piece. So maybe find a blank piece of paper, get out all your favorite colors and go to town. Thank you guys so much. We're just so honored to be here. And without further ado, I'm going to make my colleague host Veronica and Enema, thank you so much for that awesome activity. Um, it's, it's really inspiring to be able to move and to draw with music. Um, it helps, even as a musician, it helps me to listen more deeply and experience the music in a new way. Um, and for those of you who are at home, I'm really looking forward to seeing your graphic scores. So make sure you post those on social media. As I mentioned, the last piece I'm going to play is entitled Veil vale by Viet Cuong. The title Veil vale makes me think about the surface of the ocean, which is like a veil that separates us, people who live on land, with all the amazing creatures and life that's beneath the surface.
I'll turn it over to um, Dr. Hanny Rivera, who will give the last lecture portion of our uh, show this evening. Dr. Hanny Rivera is a postdoctoral associate in Dr. Davies' lab at Boston University. She studies the genetics of corals that are more tolerant of higher temperatures and also investigates the immune pathways that allow corals to host their colorful plant partners. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you so much for that beautiful piece and the others that you've uh, played for us tonight. Uh, so good evening, everyone. As Elizabeth mentioned, I'm a postdoc in Dr. Davies's lab. For those of you unfamiliar with the term, it's sort of the academic equivalent of a medical resident. Um, so tonight I'd like to talk to you about the value of corals and, and the cost of their loss and, and what we can do about it. So first I'd like to share uh, that coral reefs are, are globally distributed. Here's a map of, oh, I'm so sorry. Here's a map of the uh, coral reefs across the world shown in red. And shown in blue are just a handful of major metropolitan cities uh, across the planet. And you can see that there are lots of people um, that live near coral reefs, especially in the Caribbean and in the Indo-Pacific region. Now, corals benefit not just those of us that live in those areas, but they provide many services um, across the planet. Uh, from an economic standpoint, they protect our coasts and they bring divers and tourism uh, to our waters, and they also provide fish that uh, end up going on our, on our dinner plates. From an ecological standpoint, coral reefs are some of the most biodiverse ecosystems on the planet. They're often called the rainforest of the sea for this reason. They host thousands of species, and that even includes organisms that don't end up living their entire life on the reef. Uh, they might only spend their, their early years on the reef, uh, taking advantage of all the beautiful topography and structure that the coral provides as um, shelter and, and hiding out from other predators. So for instance, lots of our commercially important fish spend some of their early juvenile stages in coral reefs for that reason. They also provide uh, a host of uh, societal, societal benefits. For instance, there are several cancer therapies and HIV medicines that have been developed from organisms that live on coral reefs, such as sponges. And they also provide uh, a sense of wonder and exploration to many people on the planet, myself included. And so I wanted to spend today talking about what these services are, what we stand to lose, and talk a little bit about some of the communities that might lose the most uh, when uh, or if corals don't, uh, don't persist for much longer. So these combined benefits from corals can, can value, are valued as much as $100 trillion annually, right? And this is really an underestimate because a lot of these benefits are, are hard to quantify within our standard economic framework. Now, one of the things that coral reefs are, are very valuable for, which uh, Sarah alluded to a little bit earlier, is coastal protection. And this is because corals essentially act as a seawall for uh, wave energy that develops out in the open ocean. Waves that are coming towards shore and hit a coral reef break. They break on the reef instead of breaking on the shoreline. And that leads to almost a 97% reduction in the total wave energy and an 84% reduction in the wave height uh, that ends up reaching the shoreline and our, and our, and our homes and our water and our, and our land. So coral reefs really are these natural seawalls. And we're not just talking about a small stretch. We're talking about massive structures. So here on the left is the coral uh, reef track in Florida, extending from about Miami all the way down to Key West and even further down. And this is uh, on the right hand here, just a small section of the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. These aren't just, you know, a couple of, of miles long. These are massive structures that can be seen from space. These are real satellite images. And these natural seawalls, you can imagine that replicating them would be extremely expensive. And it's not that they're only providing protection, they provide all of these other benefits as well. And as Sarah mentioned, corals make, make the reef, they make these rocks. So not only are they expansive, they're also self-healing. They can, they can rebuild themselves after uh, taking a lot of that brunt uh, from a storm or a hurricane. Now, speaking of hurricanes, uh, I'm going to show you very briefly just the last uh, few decades of hurricane tracks across the planet. Um, and you might notice that a lot of these end up hitting areas that have coral reefs. So this is a, a video compiled from NOAA data. Here you see in the Caribbean, coral, uh, 
where coral is dominant, um, hurricanes going all over the place, as well as in the northern Indo-Pacific and, and southern Indo-Pacific and in Australia especially. So corals are really protecting these really hurricane-stricken areas, and they're quite valuable in that protection. In the U.S. alone, reefs provide almost 900, sorry, 94 million dollars in coastal protection each year, and this is during a boring year. This is when there's not really any big storms. During a large Category Five type storm, that protection value goes up to about 272 billion dollars. Here on the right is Hurricane Maria, which many of you might remember uh, went over Puerto Rico in 2007 as a Category 5 hurricane. And it was one of the most devastating hurricanes to make landfall um, in recent history. And even, it, even though it was so devastating, it would have been even more uh, impactful if Puerto Rico had no reefs to protect its shorelines from, from a lot of that surge. And it's not just during hurricanes that they're important. They also uh, protect against, you know, run-of-the-mill erosion. Here uh, on the left is a, is a beach in Puerto Rico. And you can see that, um, you know, here in this particular image, the sand is starting to erode away and the waves are starting to essentially crumble the land underneath this house. And reefs really offer a lot of protection against erosion such as this. Uh, they also help with sea level rise. On the right is an island called Tarawa, which is part of the Republic of Kiribati in the Central Pacific. And I'll talk a little bit more about Kiribati in just a minute. But this island, as you can imagine, is, is really low lying. It has um, kind of full exposure to all of the power of the Pacific Ocean. But because it's a reef atoll, it's surrounded by coral reefs, its shoreline manages to persist. So with rising sea level, it's, it's threatened, and actually Kiribati is one of the most vulnerable countries to uh, sea level rise. But even so, having those reefs there prevent some of that damage, some of that erosion from making um, even more impactful um, dents on that land. Now, as we know, coral reefs are also a big driver of tourism, um, and myself included, and I imagine many of you on this call also love to, to dive and see and explore coral reefs. And there's thousands of divers that travel to tropical coral reefs a year, hundreds of thousands. And even if you're the type of person that says, well, you know, I like my beach and my pina coladas, and I don't really want to get in the water with all those squirmy creatures, you still have the reefs to thank. Um, a lot of the sand that you'll find on a beach is going to be coming from that coral reef, that calcium carbonate that they make um, that eventually gets eroded and, and becomes sand. Now, um, our actions are really threatening reefs, right? We know that emissions in particular are driving a lot of these other influences that then uh, hurt coral reefs, right? With rising CO2 emissions, we increase temperatures, which drives bleaching. That also makes the corals more vulnerable to disease. Um, higher CO2 emissions also lower the pH of the oceans, which, make, which makes it harder for corals to grow and, and make the reefs. So it's all a, a really big feedback cycle that is really driven by this increase in carbon emissions. And so who's going to suffer from the loss of corals, right? I showed from the earlier image that there's coral reefs all over the planet and there's lots of people that depend on coral reefs. So the short answer is that everyone will. Um, but the perhaps slightly uh, more nuanced answer is that some are going to suffer more than others. And I'll give you a hint that it's not really the, the people in the countries that are most at fault for generating those emissions and putting corals at risk. So here again is that map again um, with corals in red. And instead, I've now colored the countries based on their GDP per capita. So the lighter the color, the sort of more uh, lower the GDP is in that country, the more you could consider it a developing country. And the darker the, the gold, the, the richer that country. And you can see that a lot of the countries that are really um, close to coral reefs are those developing countries, which aren't really producing a lot of the um, CO2 that's driving these global changes. Yet they're the ones that most heavily depend on coral reefs for, um, for both their food and for their economics. So here is a, um, is a graph that's showing the percentage of the total employment on the y-axis that's derived from tourism. And in many of these countries, which you might recognize here as Caribbean or Pacific islands, that tourism is based on coral reef and, and sort of the tropical ecology of that place. Uh, which is dependent on healthy coral reefs for it to still look beautiful and blue and, and have that sort of 
aura of paradise that we all we all crave every once in a while. And you can imagine that the loss of these reefs, especially in these countries, is going to be crippling for their economy. And COVID um, has given us a, a little bit of a preview of that with travel shut down. A lot of these countries are really struggling uh, to keep their, their sort of economy going without the tourism that's generated. So it's really a, a a circumstance where we have not only a, a really sad environmental um, impact, but a social justice inequality. And the, the countries that are least responsible are really going to bear the front of these negative impacts. And to give you an example, um, I'd like to briefly talk about Palau, which recently designated almost its entire exclusive economic zone, which is outlined here in blue, as a marine protected area. And it had already been protecting many of its waters uh, for, for several years before that. The Republic of Kiribati, which I alluded to earlier, also established in 2008 the Phoenix Islands Protected Area, which at the time was one of the largest marine protected areas in the world. And it still is, I believe, in the top 10. And so these countries are both really just leaders in ocean stewardship, and they're trying to do their best to protect their environment, and not only for themselves, but for, for all of us. And yet they're um, kind of most at risk of suffering the consequences of increasing climate change. So I'd like to, you know, just urge everyone here to really think about um, just the widespread impacts that uh, climate change has, not just in our own backyard, but across the planet. And so we know what the problem is. We know that it's rising CO2 emissions, but what do we really do about it? And now individual actions like being a vegetarian and taking uh, fewer plane rides and all of these things, which I 100% support and, and, and try to live by, they're really important. But unfortunately, to use scientific uh, sort of lingo, they're necessary, but not sufficient. This is a large scale global issue and it it's going to require large scale global coordination in order to, to really get it under control. Right? We need agreements like the, the Paris Climate Agreement and other agreements that will hopefully be even more forceful in the future. And so um, with that, I would like to leave you with a, a call to action to really um, show up in a few weeks and, and vote. And as you do that, keep in mind, you know, the people that you're electing into office and whether they really have the planet's best interests at heart. And not um, because I'm trying to be just, you know, a sort of blind tree hugger, but because these things really do end up mattering and they have long term consequences uh, beyond what we might be able to, to really grasp. So vote, um, if not for your family and for your friends and your, your future children, at least for the corals. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank everyone for your attention tonight and remind you that we still have a Q&A coming up, so please stay tuned for that. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, I am thrilled to have been here uh, hosting in the background. Um, and I'd like to now invite all of our performers and participants up uh, for a bow. Uh, we haven't tried this before. Uh, here we go. Uh, da, da, da. We hope we're all here. So uh, start off, uh, let's have a bow for Dr. Sarah Davies of Boston University. They can hear you if you clap, by the way, they can. <laughs> uh, Dr. Hanny Rivera, Boston University. Uh, Veronica Bolesky and Emma Shubin of Integral Steps. Um, behind the scenes here, we have Josh Ostrauer, our audiovisual intern. <laughs> There he is, and he composed our intro music uh, for this evening. Round of applause for Josh. Take a bow. <laughs> there we go. And of course, our pianist for this evening, Elizabeth Cladill. Um, David, a bit thrilled to be hosting the event. Um, thank you all to, uh, to all of you. Uh, thanks to you and your generosity, we're able to keep producing these events, highlighting the plight of corals around the world and the efforts of reef preservation. Um, in 2021, we're going to repeat this show uh, to a Spanish audience, uh, Regreso al Arrecife. Did I get that right, Hanny? <laughs> She's been teaching me. Yeah, um, you did. We've got, did I go okay? Uh, we've got a special um, ask uh, for you. Uh, if you visit multiverseseries.org, you can become a supporter of our reef project, uh, Regreso al Arrecife. Um, and if you uh, become a supporter, that will subsidize the ticket 
uh, for the next time we visit the reef. Um, and you'll get a, a copy of our album, Octave of Light, uh, which is coming out next month. Don't forget to follow us on socials, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter uh, for details of that, plus the winners of our competition. Final thing, join us next month for our event, our Exoplanet album launch, Octave of Light on the 12th of November with stunning animations from the Boston Science Museum. Uh, we've had some questions come in. Wait, before that, not... thank you to David for putting this together for all the time and love and effort and crazy logistics that you put together for this. So thank you, David. It's a joy, it's a joy. Thank you to everyone. So uh, we've got lots of questions about corals, but we want uh, questions about uh, the music, about the movement, just anything that came to mind. Uh, so uh, there's still time to submit your questions. Um, I've got a question, uh, Dr. Davies, what percentage of corals are resilient? Wow, Lauren, that's like a really hard question. Um, I saw that question and I was like, already thinking about how to answer that question. I still don't know how to answer that question. Um, so I think the short answer would be, we don't know. Um, I think that we know that there are specific resilient species. So when we snorkel on the reef during a bleaching event, we can see that there are certain species that seem to be fine. When we do experiments within a species, collecting corals from different places and asking how tolerant they are to thermal stress, maybe like 30% of them seem like they're more resilient than others, but it's kind of a normal distribution of like losers, you know, moderate, okay, and then winners. Um, so yeah, I don't think we know that. Um, if we did know that, we'd probably be better able to choose our restoration goals. So I think that that's, an area of active research in uh, coral biology is trying to figure out who the winners are and why. Um, I don't know if Hanny wants to add anything to that. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I'll also say that it, it's a difficult question because it also depends exactly on, on what you mean re by resilient and resilient to what. Um, sometimes what we find is that a coral might be, you know, better at, at tolerating temperature, but maybe it's not so great at tolerating something else. And so it's often the case that there's some trade-offs which make it uh, even trickier. Okay, I uh, have another uh, coral question. Uh, what are reef sensitive to other than temperature? <laughs> Everything. I feel like if you snorkel by a coral and give it a dirty look at bleaches. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but seriously, they are very sensitive creatures. So especially temperature because they live in the ocean. So they, they're basked and they can't really thermal regulate. So they're, like I said in the talk, they're sensitive to both hot and cold temperatures, um, but they're also kind of sensitive to ocean acidification, but that um, that's where the CO2 comes into the ocean and makes it more acidic. Um, so that's also a climate change problem, but one we didn't focus on tonight because corals seem to be uh, less sensitive to that. Um, and then nutrients, so runoff from, uh, you know, if you have like a bunch of fertilizers in the water and that runs off into the ocean, that can um, cause bleaching. Also, like I, I talked about that, freshwater event in Texas. So that caused all that freshwater caused an anoxic event. So where there's no oxygen for the corals, so they can't breathe. Um, so yeah, so that also is something they're sensitive to. Um, diseases, Hanny, help me out other ones. I feel like everything. <laughs> Yeah, they're they're quite sensitive to a number of things, and and some of these things interact. Um, so temperature can increase temperatures can make them more sensitive to diseases, and there are some bacteria that can also cause bleaching, and those can be more virulent at higher temperatures. So it's a little bit of a complicated a complicated mess. Yeah, like even keeping them lab. So these guys behind me are are corals that we keep in the lab, and I have this picture because these ones look really nice, um, but. Um, they're really hard to even keep happy in captivity um, and a lot of them have really variable needs so what works for one coral doesn't work for another coral so um, if you think about what think of all we know about humans and what we don't know and then imagine that each coral is like a different species so and there's hundreds of species so there's so much we have to learn about corals and that's why we love what we do. <laughs> 
I've got a question for Elizabeth now. Um, how did you choose the music uh, you played tonight? It was, I loved it, it was very interesting. Oh, um, so it, it's a long process. It involves a lot, a lot of listening, a lot of trolling through composers' websites and seeing what kind of new music might be out there that would be interesting. Um, not only do I feel strongly about choosing pieces that work individually in the program, but also work as a cohesive whole. Uh, so, you know, each of the lectures had, a, had their own emotional affect, and I really wanted the, the music to also reflect those emotional affects as well. Um, so, yeah, hours of listening, that's, that's key. That's basically it. There was another good question for you, Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, very interesting use of the piano strings to get sweeping sounds. How did Coral and their future inspire uh, the piano techniques? Um, these pieces were, well, um, I, I don't think that the, the pieces were composed. Most of them were composed in the last, 10 years, the Carl Vine was, I think, in 1990 or in 89. Um, none of them were specifically, I don't think any of the composers were specifically thinking about chorals. Um, and the piece by Aida Shirazi, Tide, um, obviously had really clear ocean references, but um, I sort of um, uh, put my own interpretation onto veil and my own interpretation onto serenity. Um, and it, uh, yeah, the pieces stand alone by themselves, but when we put them in a context with science lectures, they can take on a new meaning and we can, the science and the, and the music kind of connect to each other. And um, something that's really cool about this kind of program is that I think that both of them serve each other and then help both the science and the music speak a little more clearly to us. You want to pick the next question? Oh, I get to pick the next question. Um, are there signs of choral adaptation in the fossil record? And can we learn anything from choral adaptation around the PEPM or other prehistoric climate, climate shocks? Jeez, these are really hard questions. Um, so yes, I think that, um, I don't know about coral adaptation, like within a species, but thinking about the, like natural selection in these events, kind of allowing certain species to perform better and then becoming more dominant on the reef is definitely something that happens. Other interesting things that happen during like weird climate events, um, historically, for example, there's a region in the um geological record where there's no corals so you had corals you had reef building corals and then there's this region where there was no reef, bu reef building anymore so there was no evidence of record of coral reef building and then they came back so that was kind of like always a strange thing and some of the ocean acidification and it was during a really acidic time of the ocean um so some of the acidification experiments uh in the lab have shown that corals can do this like crazy zombie stuff where they, if you put them into really acidic conditions, they do what's called polyp bailout, where they kind of like each individual polyp. So like these things behind me, an individual one will kind of plop off and then they're like little zombie corals swimming in the water, like just like free living anemones. And then when you bring the pH back to normal, <clears throat> they'll like reattach and start secreting a calcium carbonate skeleton again as the like, um, as the chemistry, water chemistry allows them to do that. Um, so that's like the only really thing I can think to address your question because I'm not like a expert in geology, but maybe Hani has other ideas. I can't think of any like specific ones of like adaptations per se. I mean, there certainly are instances of, um, you know, as, as Sarah was alluding to, sort of shifts in the species in a community, but I don't know that we really understand exactly why those shifts happen, but yeah, I don't. Yeah, so we know, for example, the... like like the corals that do really well right now, or like the corals that we're seeing actually dominating reefs, but not really doing very well are those like plating corals that I showed you a lot of pictures of. Um, and those historically 
didn't always do well, right? So there's something about right now that, that was good for them that no longer is good for them. So that's kind of what begs the question of like, what will the reef look like in the future? Because they, it's not like we always had these big plating corals. Corals, coral reefs have changed through time, um, or at least based on the, like the geological record. Something for a future event. Um, was it, would that be paleo marine biology? Yeah, I definitely know um, some people you could talk to. One thing I like to ask uh, the audience is what would you like to see uh, in the future from Multiverse? Uh, in the next uh, several months, we'll be visiting uh, exoplanets, uh, neutrinos, and uh, black holes. So quite a lot of, uh, sort of physics, astrophysics. Um, but this project, we, we like to think that we can make connections between, well, there are, there are things we haven't had a chance to try. We're getting um, any, any research uh, and any music, we'd love to try and find the connections. And finding the connections is uh, an ongoing uh, experiment. So we, we're thrilled to have tried some new things tonight. So let us know, what would you like to see from Multiverse? Um, one of the new things we tried for the first time was in, uh, incorporating uh, Dow Crows. And we've got a question uh, for, for the Integral Steps team. Uh, Dow Crows seems like an exciting way for students to learn music. All new students draw on Dow Crows to prepare pieces as well. Um, I'll step in and then I'll let Veronica follow. Um, yes, many of us musicians encounter Dow Crows in our professional studies in conservatory as a way not only to develop our musicianship, but to help us find a way to work on a nonverbal form of art in another nonverbal way. So there's a parallelism between getting to use the body and movement to express what we understand in music, to then be able to express through music what we feel and we understand without the use of words. And so I always say to myself and to my students that I move my music and I learn it through movement and I learn it through understanding the rhythmic qualities and the phrasing qualities and the expressive nature of it so that I can stand still on a stage and move my audience. Thank you. Yeah, and I would just like to jump in and say that um, Elizabeth and I have played together quite a bit and and our shared Dalco's experiences um, have been part of our rehearsal process. And so um, we, we do enjoy, you know, taking our pieces and then inventing ways to be like, let's find a way to, you know, do a bridge together and then move it like this and we'll practice the rate of our Atel Rondo and really feel it together rather than just trying to describe it in words. And um, it's, it's just such a powerful and efficient way to agree on what you're trying to do as musicians. Um, I don't know if Elizabeth has any more thoughts on that. <laughs> All right, thanks, friend. <laughs> Great playing. Well, there's some. I, I, it's very hard to choose. So, would marine biologists like to pick a question? Um, well, I'm gonna. I was about to answer Joe Larkin's question in the chat, but he asked if climate change could lead to the formation of reefs in new places. And absolutely, that's what we're seeing in Japan. These like range expansions. Um, so that's definitely happening. We also see them in mangroves and. Um, um, other strange places. Um, so I do think we'll see changes in their ranges, changes in their ranges. That could be the next uh, talk. Um, let's see, I don't know how they make the corals reproduce twice a year. I'm guessing that it's that they keep them warmer and then bamboozle them with the lights to make them think it's summertime still. Um, but I actually don't know. Yeah, I'll go ahead and, and quickly answer uh, a couple that I, I typed the answers to. Um, one being uh, how um, how big of a threat is is sunscreen to corals. So this is something that has gotten a lot of, of press uh, in, I guess, the, the last year or two. And um, for the most part, in the in the coral community, we recognize that it's a it's certainly not great for them. But of all the things uh, facing corals, it's, it's a quite a minimal threat, right? We don't really even exactly understand how bad it is, if it is all that bad. Um, and there's certainly a lot uh, bigger threats out there that 
uh, need to be addressed, right? So I don't know if you compare it to, I guess, a medical ailment, right? It's like corals are facing like, you know, immediate heart attacks from warming temperatures and sort of cancer from uh, ocean acidification and, and the uh, sunscreen toxin, you know, might be like a, a little bruise or a little nick or a cut. So it's, it's not really what we would think is, is a major uh, urgent need. It's certainly, you know, if you want to try and, and do that as a personal action to avoid it, go ahead. But there is also a lot of uh, new research that suggests that even the sunscreens that are claiming to be reef safe are not necessarily great for the corals either. Just wear, wear, wear a rashy. <laughs> no, you don't have to wear sunscreen. <laughs> um, we are getting there, maybe one or two more questions. That Do dead coral reefs still retain some ability to protect against storms and erosion? Yeah, so they will for some period of time. So they still have the structure, um, like a dead coral reef, especially like within a year, it will still look like that, but they start to become really brittle because the live coral tissue is actually what keeps them so strong because they're always um, depositing that calcium carbonate on top and on top and on top. And then when you lose that animal, it's no longer doing that. It's open to the elements, right? So you have things that are the algae growing and then, then you have algae munchers that are like munching on the algae. Um, and then slowly it's just degrading, just, um, yeah. So then, and because the coral is no longer on it, regulating the chemistry of the skeleton, there is some dissolution that happens just naturally. And then if you have a storm, then you have these brittle dead corals and they just, they're just gone. Um, so it's yes, for some period of time, they would serve a purpose. Um, but without, if they don't recover and have live tissue on them, eventually, um, they will just turn into rubble. Well, um, we're going to wrap up our evening, um, return to that final message of, of take action. Uh, Sarah and Hanny have given us, us things that we can do individually and collectively. Um, and that's, that's really the reason that we bring music and science together is to bring these messages home. So it's been a joy to hear them speak and to have you with us. I thank uh, Sarah Davies, Annie Rivera, Veronica Boleski, Emma Shubin, uh, Elizabeth Cladill, Josh Ostrower, and we'll see you in November for Octave of Light with the Science Museum. Good night. Good night, everyone.